Texas Lutheran University. Thank you for joining us today for this month's installment of the Dr. Deborah Hedinger Alumni Faculty Lecture Series. My name is Taylor Collins. I'm a class of 2014 and the Assistant Director for Alumni Engagement. For this installment, we have Dr. Jermaine Walsh. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Taylor. And she's going to be talking about, I'm sorry, um, she's a professor of political science and teaches courses on political philosophy, feminist political thought, and public policy. A member of the Politics, Literature, and Film Affinity Group of the American Political Science Association, she has published articles on Aristotle's Nicka McCain, Ethics, Plato's Republic and Symposium, Jane Austen's Mansfield Park and Persuasion, and most recently, The Political Philosophy of J.R.R. Tolkien. She will discuss J.R.R. Tolkien's most well-known work, The Lord of the Rings. This lecture will explore two themes from Tolkien's work, how he seeks to inspire the experience of wonder and how he depicts the development of moral virtue, especially the virtue of wisdom. In considering these themes, Dr. Walsh will focus especially on two characters from Lord of the Rings, Gollum and Eowyn. Thank you, Dr. Walsh. Thank you, Taylor. Good afternoon. I would like to begin by thanking Taylor and the alumni relations staff for inviting me to participate in this lecture series named in honor of Dr. Deborah Hettinger. I remember Dr. Hettinger, Deb, with much fondness as a colleague and a friend. Today I will discuss two themes or aspects of Tolkien's work. The first is wonder, how Tolkien intends to both spark the experience of wonder and to defend its enduring value. The second theme is virtue, more specifically the virtue of prudence or practical wisdom, which Tolkien generally refers to simply as wisdom. In addressing these themes, I will focus on two characters from The Lord of the Rings, Smeagol, better known as Gollum, and Eowyn of Rohan. In Plato's Theotetus, Socrates states that philosophy begins in wonder, and in the opening of his Metaphysics, Aristotle repeats this claim. Tolkien refers repeatedly to the experience of wonder, and he treats it in a way that is quite similar to that of the ancient Greek philosophers. The experience of wonder brings on a kind of surprise, even astonishment, upon realizing that one stands in the presence of something previously unknown or unrecognized. In most cases, Tolkien depicts this experience as sparking both a recognition of one's own ignorance and the desire to know or understand. For Tolkien, as for the ancient Greek philosophers, the experience of wonder is a necessary step in the direction of wisdom. And thus, for the most part, Tolkien portrays the experience of wonder as indicating a character's potential for wisdom. While Tolkien provides very few instances of wicked or vicious characters uh, experiencing wonder, what he conveys in a few, few of these rare cases is quite instructive. For example, in explaining how Smeagol, or Gollum, came to reside at the, uh, in the caves at the base of the Misty Mountains, Gandalf provides what might be deemed a kind of reverse account of the allegory of the cave from Plato's Republic. Now, I am assuming that all of you TLU alums will remember from your freshman experience course or, or from other courses uh, about the allegory of the cave. Remember the scene with the prisoners who are chained in a cave and they can only see in front of them, they see the shadows and they think the shadows are real. And then the escaped prisoner who leaves and is eventually able to look at the light, to see the light for itself. So Gollum, after being exiled from his community, wandered for a long time, preferring the dark. 
One day, while bending over a pool, he felt a burning on the back of his head. And when he looked upon the dazzling light reflected in the water, his eyes were pained. He wondered at it, Tolkien writes, for he had almost forgotten about the sun. But significantly, rather than moving him to reflect on the existence of the sun and in its light to reflect on the truth of his situation, Gollum's experience of wonder renders him angry and resentful. For the last time, Tolkien or Gandalf tells Frodo, uh, he looked at the sun and shook his fist at her. Uh, now I shall turn to the theme of wisdom. Tolkien depicts some characters, such as Gandalf, who exhibit the virtue of wisdom, and he depicts others, such as Saruman, who exhibit the vice that most closely resembles wisdom, that is, cunning or cleverness. Wisdom, Tolkien maintains, entails the ability to recognize and attain those ends that are in accord with what is truly good, and to do so using only good or proper means. The clever or cunning, by contrast, pursue wicked ends and are willing to use wicked means to achieve them. In addition to contrasting wisdom and cunning, Tolkien depicts another mode of judgment that, while not a virtue, nevertheless falls short of wisdom per se. In the character of Eowyn of Rohan, we encounter a particular mode of judgment exercised by a woman who, though gifted with respect to intelligence and nobility, has not, at least not yet, developed wisdom in the complete sense. Her capacity to judge is hampered, Tolkien indicates, by her belief that honor, specifically the honor won through courage in battle, is the greatest good. In his portrayal of Eowyn, Tolkien illustrates both the strengths and the weaknesses of the desire for honor. Eowyn's mode of judgment is revealed most clearly in her encounter with Aragorn, just before he sets out for the paths of the dead. Upon learning what Aragorn intends to do, Eowyn first seeks to dissuade him, telling him that to seek the paths of the dead entails a mad desire to seek death. However, once it becomes clear to her that Aragorn will not change his mind, she asks him to let her accompany him. Eowyn says that she is weary of skulking in the hills, of performing what to her way of thinking is the relatively unimportant task of minding the house while the warriors win renown. In refusing her request, Aragorn makes two points. First, he reminds her that she has been appointed to rule in King Theoden's place, while he, Theoden, is away at war. And second, Aragorn tries to persuade her that the fulfillment of this duty is not, as she seems to think, something relatively unimportant. If honor is what she seeks, she will not gain it by abandoning her position of rule in order to accompany him. Even more importantly, Aragorn tries to persuade her not only to do what is right for its own sake, rather than for the sake of honor, but also to recognize that her understanding of virtue, of what is truly worthy of honor, is too narrow. If the armies of Rohan and Gondor are defeated, he tells her, she, along with the other survivors, may have to perform acts of valor without renown. In a crucial corollary, Aragorn adds that such deeds will not be less valiant because they are unpraised. Not understanding Aragorn's true character, namely that he himself has performed countless acts of valor without renown, Eowyn is not persuaded. Rather, she assumes that Aragorn does not really believe what he says, that he speaks this way 
only because she is a woman and thus incapable of performing any genuinely valiant acts. Thus she responds by asserting that though a woman, she has a royal lineage and possesses the quality highly regarded by her people. She tells him, I am of the house of Eor and not a serving woman. I can ride and wield a blade and I do not fear either pain or death. Her point is that she could do more good by using her skills in the war against Mordor rather than wasting them, as she is keenly aware, both King Theoden and her brother Eomer refused to do, by remaining behind with those unable to make war. Recognizing it would seem that there is nothing further he can say to persuade her, Aragorn responds not by arguing with her any further, but by asking what she does fear. She answers in complete accord with the line of reasoning she has employed thus far, that she fears only a cage, having to stay behind bars until all chance of doing great deeds is gone beyond recall or desire. Once Aragorn departs, Eowyn despairs, convinced that with his decision to take the paths of the dead, all hope of victory over the forces of Mordor is now lost. She decides that it would be better to die in battle at Theoden's side than to remain and await an inglorious death. Hence, she disguises, as, she disguises herself as a man and accompanies Theoden into battle. When Theoden is killed, Eowyn alone withstands the terror of the Ringwraith to defend the fallen king. Amazingly, she kills the Ringwraith's flying steed and with the assistance of the Hobbit Mary, the Ringwraith himself. Afterward, while recovering in the Houses of Healing, Eowyn encounters Faramir, who, like her, has been gravely injured and may not return to battle. Faramir is uniquely situated to both understand and assist her. During his fateful meeting with Frodo and Sam in Athelion, Faramir had spoken of the people of Rohan, offering both praise and criticism in a way that mirrors what is worthy of both praise and criticism in Eowyn. While the people of Gondor have benefited greatly from the fierce valor of the people of Rohan, who have ever proved true to us, aiding us at need, the Gondorians have also, regrettably, become more like the people of Rohan, in that they now love war and valor as things good in themselves, both a sport and an end. Like the Rohirrim, the Gondorians now also esteem a warrior above men of other crafts. Now, when Faramir learns of, Quotos, of Frodo's quest to unmake the ring, he is amazed, wondering whether the folk of the Shire are all like Frodo, that is, willing to take up a noble but virtually hopeless task, and thus to exercise, one might say, the most extreme form of valor without renown, Faramir remarks that, if so, the Shire must be a realm of peace and content, and there must gardeners be in high honor. Now his point is not that warriors should not be honored, or that war is not at times necessary, but rather that the best society will be one in which gardeners, that is, those adept at bringing forth and cultivating life in all its fullness, would be even more esteemed than warriors. Now, when Faramir gently refuses Eowyn's request to be released and sent back into battle, she is taken aback, assuming that from his point of view, she probably appears to be like a child who does not possess the firmness of mind to go on with a dull task to the end. Seeing herself through his eyes, she begins in what, what one might call Socratic fashion, to know oneself, she begins to acknowledge her deficiencies, 
to question her seemingly certain judgments. For the first time, Tolkien writes, she doubted herself. Intrigued by her and moved to pity her, Faramir seeks out her company. In him, she finds a companion who, while her equal in spirit and courage, is also, as she is both perceptive and honest enough to admit, her superior in wisdom. As together they endure with patience the hours of waiting, Eowyn grows, as never before, in self-understanding. When Eowyn hesitates to accept Faramir's offer of love, he discerns that her uncertainty is rooted in her confusion over her feelings for Aragorn. With regard to Aragorn, Faramir tells her that in both her love for Aragorn as well as her response to Aragorn's inability to return her love, she has displayed immaturity of judgment. Likening her regard for Aragorn to that of a young soldier who admires a great captain, Faramir explains that her feelings for Aragorn grew out of her mistaken desire for honor alone. Because she wished to have renown and glory and be lifted far above the mean things that crawl on the earth. She believed herself in love with the high and puissant Aragorn. But when Aragorn failed to return her love, Faramir argues, she made her most grave mistake, desiring then to have nothing unless a brave death in battle. With regard to his own feelings, Faramir admits that while he initially pitied her, he now loves her. When he looks at her, he no longer sees a woman who should be pitied, but rather a lady high and valiant, one who has won renown that shall not be forgotten, and who shall always have his love, whatever her circumstances, even should she become the blissful queen of Gondor. As she ponders these words, Tolkien writes, the heart of Eowyn changed, or else at last she understood it. In accepting Faramir's love and offering her love to him in return, she speaks about herself in a way that is reminiscent of Faramir's words to Frodo and Sam in Athelion. Recognizing now that some things are even more worthy of pursuit than the renown gained through valor in battle, she no longer wishes to be a warrior who takes joy only in the songs of slaying. Rather, echoing Faramir's earlier words to Frodo and Sam about how good it would be to live in a society that honors gardeners, she says that she now intends to become a healer, to love all things that grow and are not barren. Faramir, in joyful response, tells her that they shall dwell in fair Athelian, and there make a garden. Uh, the one question we have is your class that you teach over J.R.R. Tolkien. Uh -huh. What all books and what kind of major topics or themes do you discuss? Is there anything in particular? About the, about the course? Mm -hmm. Just in general. Well, the course um, focuses on the Lord of the Rings, of course, because that's sort of, you know, in addition to being Tolkien's most famous work, it's um, the, the one, one that, that was the most complete uh, upon his death. But he also wrote uh, a number of works before writing the, the Lord of the Rings. Um, he, well, what he set out to do was to sort of imagine that um, the sort of original legends of Old English had, um, had not been lost, right? Because of the, about the only, well, there's only a few works left in Old English one of which is Beowulf. That's probably the most famous one. Um, but he tried to imagine if the original works had been, um, if they survived, what would they be like? So he wrote these sort of legends about the elves um, that included, eventually included men, included the, the dwarves, and so on. And um, when you read, those of you who have read The Lord of the Rings, if that's what you're familiar with, you. Uh, you, you have the sense of this great background, sort of this whole history that's gone before. And um, that's because 
Tolkien had already created all this, what we might call these back legends or, or histories of earlier times. And so um, there's a work that's, that uh, Tolkien's son Christopher published after Tolkien died um, called The Silmarillion. So we read that, we read The Silmarillion along with The Lord of the Rings and then a couple of other shorter essays that um, Tolkien wrote about the nature of fairy story. Is that sufficient if that answers your question? <laughs> uh, I think that's all of our questions today. Okay. So I want to thank you for okay. coming in for the lecture and sure. remind people that our next edition is going to be December 15th. It's going to be with Pastor Stewart. It's going to be about putting the silent back into silent night. Thank you for joining us. For more information, please visit tlu.edu.